the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Uh, today we will continue our commentaries on the epistle of St. Paul to Romans, chapter 8 and verse 21. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. I want to comment again about this glorious liberty of the children of God. Because, you know, we got the liberty or the freedom out of the captivity of the power of sin by the death of the Lord and by the holy sacraments. But the full picture, the glorious liberty, we will be gained in the day of his coming, second coming. Now we're still present in this body. We still have this war inside our hearts. Sometimes we are not as good as we should be Christ-like. But you know, continuous striving is important. But with the end of the story, this is the glorious liberty of the children of God. So we are Tasting this liberty for now, we are touching this future taste of the kingdom of heaven. We are feeling the kingdom of heaven in our hearts when we pray good, when we love people, when we follow the commandments of Christ, when we are led by the Spirit. But you know, the glorious liberty, the, the last picture of, of the saved people, will be there on the day of his second coming. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth bangs together until now. So all the creation suffer. All the world has problems, pain everywhere. People are not happy on this earth. And we are always surrounded by the disasters. That's because this picture is not the one who were planned by God. This is, you know, the distorted one made by the hand of man with the hand of devil. So the whole creation groans and labors with birth bangs. So he took the words of the Lord Jesus Christ when he spoke about the birth bangs, the pains or the sufferings for the woman who are going to give birth to a baby. At these last minutes, she suffered a lot. She suffers a lot. She feels this, um, this cramps, this uh, colic, this pain. But it's important for the birth of the new life. So he made it about the whole creation that we are suffering in order to give birth to the new life, the coming life, the kingdom of God. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown without, within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption. So some people may think that being saved with the baptism, with the Eucharist, so we need not to suffer anymore. Now we are the people of God, the Holy Spirit is in our heart, there is no problem anywhere. Actually, that's not true. We, even the baptized people, the saved people, those who are named Christian because they have Christ in their heart by His Spirit, still we suffer. We groan like others, waiting for the adoption. Then adoption happened. When you think adoption happened when we had this Spirit in our heart. But the full picture of being adopted to God is not here now. The full picture of the children of God will be there in heaven, that we will be praised by the angels like the children of God, the glorious a picture of the children of God. So adoption may be used to explain the fruit of redemption when Christ died for us and um, we, he uh, restored his life again for us, he gave us the new life. So now we are his children by the Spirit. But you know, we still have this body. And with this, you know, um, power inside us to, to draw us back, 
backward. So we are not in the full picture of adoption. We are now the Son of God, but later on in the future, after taking off this body, we will enjoy the full picture of adoption being children of God. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit. The first fruits of the Spirit means the, all the fruits uh, comes after the Holy Sacraments. We are named after Christ, we are members in the Church, we are getting the Eucharist, we are enjoying now the fruits of the Spirit, love, peace, joy, uh, self-control, faith, all this, but still, we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. So the last step in the story of salvation is to redeem this body, to take a new uh, body which can stay forever in the kingdom of heaven. This glorious body, this a new one, we will be taken on the second coming of the Lord. This will be the last step in the story. For we were saved in this hope. So we still have hope in the coming future with the coming of the Lord to save us from this earthly body. But hope that is seen is not hope. So when you say that you are hoping for anything, you wait for this to happen. But if you have something, you cannot say that I hope for this because you have it. So all the fruits we have now, that's not the issue of hope. The hope is for the future to have this full picture of glorious liberty of the children of God. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. So we are waiting to enjoy the kingdom of heaven. Now we are joying partially. We are the son of God, but you know, we still do sin. We are not enjoying all the peaceful uh, taste of heaven, but we taste it in a way. So partially we are saved but the full salvation will be achieved with the coming of our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ, to take us with him to the kingdom of heaven. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. So we're still weak, and we have this war inside our hearts, and lusts everywhere, and this world is full of darkness, and we still live in this world. So we cannot say like we had been saved fully. But you know, the Spirit now helps us with this. For we do not know what we should pray for, as we ought, but, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us. Sometimes you do not know what to say in praying, because you are just praying for many things which are not necessarily. But when you pray with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will tell you what to say, will teach you what to ask for, will push you the, the right way. So he said it this way, we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us. So as if the Holy Spirit is praying, is crying out in our hearts, and we are just praying the words given by the Spirit while praying. That, that's what the saints call uh, spiritual prayer. It's not the act of praying, it's how to pray with the guidance of the Spirit. The Spirit speaks on your tongue, speaks in your mind, speaks in your heart with the real needs you need, with the uh, will of God inside our, uh, your heart. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. You know, you cannot say these words again because it was not yours. 
these words were the spirit words. That's why you cannot, you know, invent it by yourself. Now he who searched the hearts knows what the mind of the spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Which means that because the Holy Spirit knows everything and he can see the full picture, he knows exactly what I need for myself now to pray for. Because I do not need, I do not need money or eating or success. These needs will be given by the gifts of God, but the real need to be good, to be Christ-like, to be a saint, these needs the Holy Spirit will know. And the Holy Spirit will push me to pray these words, to ask, to cry out for this. So the guidance of the Spirit will help me to pray right, in the right way. He who searched the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Which means when you pray for many earthly things, you're still away from the um, guidance of the Spirit. When you are a spiritual man, in your prayer you will ask for different things. You may ask for uh, the purity of your heart. You may cry out, for the salvation of people around. You may ask to have um, the virtues of Christ himself, the fruits of the Spirit. So your requests in the prayer will be different from everyone because you are not saying the usual words. You are speaking the needs you need and the Holy Spirit will tell you what to say. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Because we love Christ and we love to live forever with him, all things around, all things in our life, all circumstances help for this purpose because there is no other purpose. God wants all of us to be saved. So he puts all things just to push us the way he likes. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God. That's a promise from God that when you love God, all things, not something, not most of the things, but all things work together for good. Nothing bad will happen to you. The devil cannot stop you from the spiritual growth because you love God. So he can lead your way. He can guide you the way if even if you do not understand everything. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Now there were two big words here. The foreknowledge of God and the predestination of God. You know, God knows everything. So God knows even the future. That's not easy to understand because we cannot see the future. We may know something about the past. We can see the, the, the present. But for the future, no one can know exactly what will happen, but God knows. And this knowledge of the future, they call it the foreknowledge because God sees what will happen tomorrow. Maybe what will happen is not always what God will wants because man choose to do things. But whatever man will choose to do, God could see before they do it. That's the foreknowledge. So because of this power of God, the Almighty God, the Pantocrator, he had this foreknowledge. That's why he can choose somebody before even doing good because he could see that this man one day he will choose his way that's not easy to understand you know because usually anyone choose somebody according to his deeds but these deeds for us is what we see in the present but for God even the deeds of the future he could see before th this happened and because of this foreknowledge, he can choose people uh, by this predestination. 
It's not, you know, that God chose haphazardly. It's not like God wants some people to be saved and others to be condemned. God wants everyone to be saved. But according to his foreknowledge, he could see those good people who will stick to his word, who will fight to be good, who will try to be guided by the Spirit till the end of their days. And these will be the chosen people. So he chose with these words, the foreknowledge and predestination. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. So the purpose is to be on the image of his Son, to be all of us Christ-like people. So the kingdom of heaven, all people, all members in the kingdom of heaven are simply the image of God, the Christ-like people. And these people were chosen, but the, by saying chosen, it does not mean that God chose them and he was harsh against others. No, they chose God, that's why he chose them. They um, did in their life many good deeds, proving that they want the full will of God. That's why they were chosen and this was by his foreknowledge and predestination, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. The full picture of the coming future uh, life, eternal life, is Christ at the firstborn, and all the saved people are his brothers and sisters, because they were all like him on his image. They restored the good, pure picture of Christ in themselves with the help of the Holy Spirit. Moreover, who, whom he predestined, this he also called. So by predestination, he called these people to be his people. Whom he called, this he also justified. And because these people wants his will, he called them, they accepted his call, and he could see this by his foreknowledge. So he justified them. He gave them the justification. And uh, whom he justified this, he also glorified. So he could see their reaction. And by this, he showed them. He called them. He um, justified them then he glorified them. What then shall we say to these things when you just meditate on all these deeds of God for the salvation of man? If God is for us, who can be against us? So you have to be full of hope because as far as God wants us to be saved, God loves us that way. And God told us to be his people. Who can stand against his will? As far as you put your hand in, your ha in his hand and you want to follow him and you believe in him and you were born again in baptism by him and you stick to him by repentance and Eucharist, who can stand against you? He who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? So when you look to the cross and you could see that God gave his only begotten son, his beloved son, to at the sacrifice for human beings. Now, what do you expect? God can give you anything. Nothing is, you know, precious more than his, the blood of his son. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? He will give us all things through him. And we have this, you know, guarantee, this um, proof that because of his redemption, the death of the Lord Christ, his only begotten son on the cross, now we hope for eternity. Glory to God. Amen.